Wonderful. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining today for this conversation to discuss uh, Georgia's recent foreign agent proposed law. Uh, I am thrilled to be joined here by a distinguished panel uh, to discuss uh, Georgia's recent legislation that threatened to stigmatize and marginalize journalists and civil society uh, organizations that were critical of the country's rulers. Uh, I am thrilled to be joined today uh, by four distinguished panelists. Uh, we will also be joined by Ambassador Kurt Volker to moderate this conversation, uh, and he'll be joining in just a few minutes. To discuss this important issue, I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, Nino Yevgenidze, who's the Executive Director of the Economic Policy Research Center. Uh, Julie George, who is the Associate Professor of Political Science at Queens College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Eka Gagari, who is the Executive Director of Transparency International Georgia. And Shota Givineria, who is the Non-Resident Fellow at the Economic Policy Research Center and a lecturer at Baltic Defense College. Thank you all for being here today to discuss this important issue uh, in the current state of, of Georgia's democracy. Uh, I'd like to start by, by turning the floor over to, um, to Nino to, to start things off and provide us kind of an overview of the current situation on the ground and, and what are the latest developments. Thank you so much, first of all, to SIPA organizing this really very timely like discussion and thanks a lot for your help and uh, support of the Georgian Democratic Forces because today is really very important day in Georgia and once again the uh, selfless struggle of Georgians stopped the uh, irreversible decoupling of Georgia from the Euro-Atlantic integration and its uh, democratic development. Uh, by initiating the rush to this kind of first hearing voting of the foreign agents law uh, the Georgian uh, Dream uh, ruling majority has confirmed its close connection uh, yeah. and with the civil society organization for a, many, many years talking about this, uh, that uh, their close connection with the Russia and readiness to serve as a proxy force in this region. Uh, the pressure of the international community of the US and the EU uh, the Georgian civil society organizations, opposition, media, public personalities, and even the sports celebrities, the public rallies of historical scale made it impossible uh, uh, for even Ishwili's puppets to uh, attain its goal at this stage. But uh, we should not celebrate that victory yet because uh, we should stay very careful and prudent about the current situation. Uh, this is not triumph yet. Uh, the main, main political uh, lines and paradigms of the Georgian dream is uh, still the same. Besides the rhetoric of the Georgian dream, personalities indicates that they don't reconsider their position as a whole. The only problem they see is the Russian law was not explained good enough to the public and the Georgian society was manipulated by the foreign, foreign agents uh, like we are here, <laughs> me, Eka, Shota, and some other many, many thousands of Georgians who represent the democratic forces uh, of Georgia. This proves that they will uh, use the first opportunity they will, have, uh, they will have to get back to this matter. Georgian Dream has a rich track record of manipulation and the lies so-called like uh, strategic retreats, when they use later opportunities to realize their goals in the easier setting. One of the most known example is uh, when they back cracked the proportional electoral system, even if really promised after violent crackdown of this Gavril of night protests, even the first hearing of the Russian law was organized unpredictably fast and the, in the urgency to devoid Georgian society is the time to organize the protest. Besides that, the uh, verbal promises made today uh, from the Georgian dream government means nothing practically as the law should be voted uh, out at the second hearing by the very same people who voted in favor of the two days ago. It seems that the first opportunity for the vote will be at the end of the March. So naturally conclusion should be should be made only after end of the uh, uh, voting. It is clear that at this stage they failed, but everything shows that the, they are not going to go back for a long time and they will double their efforts to demonize the civil society organizations 
all the partners the West have in Georgia and to finalize Georgia's return to the Russian backyard. Now it's important as ever to use the momentum to further pressure the Georgian dream and uh, uh, this Russian uh, oligarchy Venezuela and use every tool to the United States and the European Union have at their hands to stop the dangerous dynamic they have initiated because uh, the Georgian people and that first of all the Georgian young uh, like a generation brought Georgia again back to the uh, foreign policy agenda which the Georgian dream government was trying last 10 years to uh, to diminish Georgia's role in the democratic development. And uh, we would love again to have your, like, you know, the careful, very, uh, very, very sober attention on this regard because uh, they, uh, they need to pay and they have to pay for the all backsliding where the Georgia was facing uh, last, uh, last few years. Thanks a lot. I will stop here and uh, I'm pretty sure my colleagues will uh, continue to, to, uh, get you more information and more details on this regard. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nino. Uh, and I'd love to bring in Eka to the conversation. And Eka, I'd particularly be curious to hear, you know, your thoughts on the current state of affairs in, in Georgia with regards to this, um, this proposed legislation. Uh, I'd also be curious to hear your thoughts on, on the recent protests. Uh, I know it's been uh, really inspiring to see so many Georgians take to the streets and uh, you know, really uh, stand against uh, this proposed legislation. Um, so over to you, uh, Neka, for your, your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Thank you for organizing this session. Uh, it's, it's very important for us to, for, for our Western friends to understand what is really going on in Georgia. Uh, first of all, uh, yes. So as you said, people are very inspiring. So they are protesting, they are gathering on the streets, they are peaceful. Uh, and there are uh, many different groups, as Nino mentioned. So there are students, there are artists, there are doctors, teachers, like really, really different uh, uh, representatives from different groups of, of, of society. So, and uh, when uh, uh, so sometimes ago, when uh, sometimes we uh, were hearing that where is Georgian people, why they are not expressing their opinion about the backsliding of democracy in Georgia. So so this is that really the proof that yes, when there is a momentum, when a uh, country needs the like you know for for the people to express their opinion to stop the backsliding, they are there, and especially when it comes to the choice of the people, so where the country should go, uh, it should be Russia or the West. People are there, really. They they are very active and they understand that the only right way for Georgia to develop is the, the direction of, of the West. And of course, everyone wants the, for Georgia to become the EU and NATO member. But also like why, why the GD is doing this, right? The Georgian dream, the ruling party. Uh, why they are doing this and um, I will list several like opinions that that, that are like you know, widely discussed in uh, in Georgian public now the first is of course that they want to have the Russian uh, style ruling in uh, in Georgia and uh, this is for clear it was clear for us even years ago uh, but it uh, we did not have like really clear signs of this we had some signs and we those who are working on the ground of course, we we knew that this is this is what is coming. But now it's so obvious that they don't want uh, in Georgia to, to, for the uh, critical voices to exist. Uh, why? Because they are very comfortable when there is no one who can criticize uh, their uh, policies and initiatives. The second and uh, the second thing is that why now right so why they have introduced this law now because um, everyone is uh, expecting the decision from the european union and they did this previously as well when there was this first chance for georgia to become the eu membership candidacy status they have arrested uh, the independent media outlets uh, direct executive director and now this person is in the prison Nika Baramia. so that was also one of the reasons 
reasons why at that time we, 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 we have refused. And now this is the, what the public is discussing that yes, so they did this by purpose. They just want for the EU to, to say no. You know, and for the Georgian generations to like you know, not to have chance to integrate uh, integrate into European Union, and the third one I would say uh, is the uh, the elections in 2024. They are preparing to maintain in power. They they are preparing the clean field for themselves, not to have the critical media and the and the civil society in order to uh, win these elections um, and like you know again uh, and win these elections by the way uh, with the entire best messages this is what they are doing for for months now when they spreading the fake news through their uh, propaganda media like tv media and post tv and um, like really spending huge resources for this to persuade georgian people that the, apparently the western partners are our enemies and not friends that the western partners want uh, georgia to drag in war that they intervene in the in, uh, internal affairs of georgia and so on so this is this is why they are doing this apparently and um, i would agree with um, Nino, that uh, yes, so we, of course, today we are celebrating and people are going to the streets. Now there, were, there was this big uh, march of uh, the students from the universities and people are there, the huge crowd is there, but we know that they, ca they can lie and we don't trust what they uh, announced today. So we know that they will use, and they said this, they, they will use this 10 days or some, they like, you know, more than one week to, again uh, through their propaganda channels to persuade people that all these people who are critical who are trying to like really uh, um, make sure that georgia will join the eu and nato that they are the foreign agents the spies they are undermining the interest of the country and um, this is why one of the requests of the uh, of today's uh, demonstration is that they should vote vote this uh, law out as soon as possible. We are also negotiating with the president of Georgia for her to um, uh, to organize this uh, extraordinary session, um, and the another request is to release all these more than ninety. Uh, arrested people, the civic activists, uh, including the politicians who were arrested, who did not have the chance to have the lawyers for these days, who are beaten up, actually. And uh, some of them we even didn't, don't know where they are. They were taken out from the capital somewhere in other cities of Georgia. And we, until now, we try to find out where they are. So I'll stop here and I'm ready to answer on your questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Eka. Um, certainly a lot, to, a lot to discuss there. And I think the two points that you mentioned, um, an extraordinary session to, to vote down this legislation, um, despite the fact that the Georgian Dream has announced it is going to be withdrawing the legislation, uh, is really important. And of course, uh, releasing, releasing the prisoners, as you mentioned. Um, Julie, I'd like to, to turn over to you and bring you into this conversation. Um, and and present a, a similarly general question. You know, what is what is your state of uh, what is your assessment of the situation in Georgia, and what do um, the recent protests and the government's recent actions say about the the direction that Georgia is heading? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this um, panel. It's um, it's a sober time, of course, for Georgia. I, I think that the uh, the most important thing to recognize here is that uh, these events are not. Um, new um, in the sense that the the consolidation of paternal power by the Georgian Dream Party has been ongoing and has been ongoing for a while. Uh, the These recent events reflect what I think is a, an abandonment of its strategic ambiguity towards Western engagement. That is for the longest time, for the, you know, the last decade, uh, the Georgian Dream Party in Georgia and, and also regimes, you know, other parties in power prior to the Georgian Dream taking power in 2012 uh, have operated under a, a kind of pro-Western umbrella. Even under Shevardnadze, there were there were links to the West. Um, and we really see it moving under uh, the Saakashvili presidency and then 
uh, it maintaining um, into the Georgian Dream leadership um, and now declining. Uh, and I think the thing that has really pushed the change here um, is the war in Ukraine and the offer of EU membership uh, to Ukraine and Moldova and, and Georgia uh, being part of that group application process. Um, and what that did is it fundamentally revealed the problems um, and deficiencies inside the Georgian framework. Part of the EU, uh, part of the EU response to the Georgian application, which uh, was announced last year, uh, was that in order to move forward, they needed to de-oligarchize, which is to uh, step away from the patronal system of of party politics that has really kind of become the the sole element of the party, the, the Georgian Dream's reach um, inside the system, um, and step away from uh, their oligarch, Bitsine Vyanashvili. Uh, and because he is the head of the party, and because he is the patron of the party, and because the party has become a fully patronized party, it's a patronage party now, whereas before it, it had different elements, now it's almost fully uh, a party based on patronage. Uh, this is a non-star of course, for the Georgian dream, because it means they have to abandon the very thing that legitimizes and maintains their, their authority. Uh, so from last year, from this decision, we can really see a shift, an abandonment of the strategic ambiguity of pro-Western speech, um, and now a demonization of the West. That is very much akin to uh, the parallels that we've seen in other post-communist places where the West, um, as you know, someone who, as, a, as an entity that promotes free media, as an entity that promotes opposition and, and competitive politics, um, is now demonized because, of course, opposition and competitive politics, uh, politics are an anathema to authoritarian governance. Uh, so, so this thing now, this, this agent's law, uh, in my mind, uh, is not a shift in the ongoing trajectory of Georgian politics, but rather a shift in its front face. Um, and all of that has been accelerated by Ukraine, um, by the war in Ukraine, by Zelensky's uh, ability to kind of pivot the war into a war of good versus evil, um, and also the linkage of the previous leadership, uh, Mikhail Saakashvili and the United Nations, uh, the national movement um, with Ukraine and governance. Saakashvili left Georgia to be inside Ukraine. And so it's very hard, I think, to continually demonize the United National Movement, the biggest opposition group, which is, has been fairly quashed in recent years, especially with the, um, the incarceration of Mikhail Saakashvili. Uh, it's very hard then to, uh, to promote the Zelensky um, narrative. Um, and that puts Georgia in a very, very, very difficult space, uh, both in terms of its domestic trajectory, but also in terms of its international posturing. Um, and as such, then uh, we see a rejection of the West and a demonization of it. Elections are coming up. Um, the Georgian dream is decreasingly popular. Uh, the plurality of Georgians indicate that they think that the country is going in the wrong direction. Um, more people indicate that they don't know which party they prefer than prefer the Georgian Dream. Georgian Dream polls at about 20%. Um, there's no obvious uh, opposition role, but uh, elections in Georgia have not been free or fair in the last two cycles, um, at least, as, as observers have reported and Freedom House has been able to, to document. Uh, so it's not that they're worried about losing the election. It's that they need to they need to provide some kind of accountability to their larger population, especially those outside Tbilisi who are not as hooked in to the opposition media investigative journalism that's done um, by TI and by so many just really excellent groups. Uh, but rather, they need to make a narrative that is appealing. I um, mean, this anti-Western narrative is one that they can um, that they think it, it appears that they think that they can pick up and, and move forward with, um, although, you know, the riots um, and the, the not the riots, the protests in the streets kind of show the, the kind of weakness of that argument for them. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, a lot of a lot of really interesting points. Uh, and, uh, you know, pretty clear that uh, from from your analysis, this is uh, certainly the next step in a, in a very concerning trend of uh, democratic democratic backsliding um, and more questions to come soon but uh, next I want to to bring in Shota um, Shota um, would love to you know hear your thoughts on um, what you think this latest latest series of events tells us about the direction that Georgia is heading um, and a little bit more about the the protests and and what um, what they mean for um, the future of of Georgia's uh, democracy great thank you First of all, to SIPA and everybody involved for organizing this uh, most timely 
event. Uh, and we do see this as the sign of support to Georgia, and, and uh, we really do appreciate because now putting Georgia uh, on the agenda and on the spotlight, especially in Washington, is one of the very important things now because the world is, for a good reason, consumed by what is going on in Ukraine. And uh, thanks God for that. I mean, that's not the message, but. Georgia is also there in a very, very desperate situation because we are really losing the country without having a hot phase of war. So Russia's hybrid warfare uh, rolls out in a different form in Georgia. Uh, and, you know, this hybrid warfare, we have been talking about this and it has been mystified in a way and people think it's still an abstract construct. It's not. It's the use of all instruments of national power interchangeably uh, to achieve specific objectives. And these objectives are linked to the influences. So what Russia does is that they choose the instrument of their national power uh, based on the specific objectives they have in specific points in time. So sometimes it's the military instrument of power like it was in Georgia in 2008 or now in Ukraine. Sometimes it's informational domain uh, that is most relevant for achieving their objectives. Sometimes it's economic pressure. Uh, so at this point in time in Georgia, they use different instruments of their national power for pressure. But these instruments of national power that they use in Georgia are much more effective than the military tool they use in Ukraine because they're losing in Ukraine. They're not able to achieve their objectives despite this massive uh, 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 invasion by the brutal military force and uh, Ukrainians bravely were able to repel that aggression and attack. But in Georgia, this non-military instruments of power in combination with military pressure that is coming from the occupied regions in the face of Russia's military presence there and on daily basis moving and shifting this so-called physical borders or uh, boundaries or uh, barriers between the occupied territories and the rest of Georgia. They put enormous pressure on Georgia's society, uh, on Georgia's government. And now we see that Georgia's government or the regime has actually come to the point when they have fallen fully to the blackmail and pressure from Russia, they lost any kind of ability to resist pressure from Kremlin. They have aligned themselves fully with Moscow. And they, they, it has been happening for a while now. And the ladies before me have outlined this uh, very skillfully. I'll just confirm that. They have always had you know, this huge gap between the pro-Western narratives and what they were doing in terms of policy. There was the huge gap between the policy and narrative. But now what Ukraine, what invasion and war in Ukraine did is that they were pushed to choose sides. They were pushed to take sides from Moscow, as well as by the circumstances in general. It was not possible to pretend to be still pro-Western, pro-European, pro-NATO, pro-United States, and do what they're doing with regard to Ukraine. So when, when this time to take sides uh, uh, came about a year ago, they have clearly chosen the side to be on Russia's side in this, because as I said, they have been constantly under this enormous pressure by Kremlin, that, and gradually they have turned into a regime that is actually acting as the agent of Russia's influence in this country. And then in this process, they realized that the only possible thing that can threaten their stay in power is more democracy, more EU, more reforms. In other words, you know, fulfilling the conditions that were listed in Charles Michel's agreement before and they threw it out of window. Now these conditions in other wording and other sequence maybe are listed 
under the 12 recommendations that the EU gave us uh, as a precondition for getting the EU candidate status. They understand that if they do any of those, they will lose next elections. That's why by design, uh, Western orientation is in contradiction with their objective, which is to stay in power for as long as possible. Now, I will cut it short because I think everybody understands this already by now. What we need really is the appropriate policy from our friends and partners that will reflect this reality. Because the policies from Washington, from EU, are still driven by the understanding that they have an ally in Tbilisi, maybe a difficult one, but still an ally, and they're trying to shift or uh, gear them or change their behavior by this, you know, half measures or political messaging or diplomatic statements. It's not the case. We're losing Georgia because there is no active and proactive policy from the EU, from the US. We have been responding to what Russia was doing there for years, if not decades. And there is a very good lesson from Belarus, from Minsk, what these policies of reacting every time there was something going on from the West brought us to. They, and, and, and this is inevitably what is going on in Georgia. This is going that particular way. It is Belogruzia gonna come about sooner than anybody thinks if we're not able to stop this madness with this ugly law that is uh, coming here. So please, everybody who is listening now and has any influence on policy making in Washington, make a clear distinction between what the people of Georgia, the society of Georgia, uh, sees as the national interests of this country and what the regime wants to do in this country. And of course, correlate this with what United States interests in the first place are in this part of the world. And then think, is this regime that is in Georgia now that has openly been supporting Putin since the war started in Ukraine, they failed to blame Russia for starting war, for God's sake. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, right? So is this regime, which is doing all this, going to be a reliable strategic partner for the United States uh, based on the charter legislation? Um, but I would like to, to bring back in um, some of the other, other folks into this conversation. And, uh, you know, really just ask, uh, I know we've already mentioned the um, Georgia's candidacy to the EU uh, recently, uh, uh, last June, uh, the European Commission presented 12 recommendations that, that Georgia needed to satisfy uh, to qualify for candidate status. Uh, and the, the deadline for these reforms was originally in December of 2022. It has since been extended to uh, later in 2023. Um, but of course, this is a serious step back, um, this proposed legislation. And as, as you've all mentioned in your opening remarks, um, there are several other issues that are threatening uh, Georgia's EU ambitions. Uh, and more than 80% of Georgians uh, uh, want to join the EU and, and have Euro-Atlantic ambitions. Um, so I'd like to, to pose, pose the question to the group, um, you know, how, how does this most recent um, this most recent uh, scenario affected Georgia's Euro Atlantic ambitions, and and will it be able to to get back on track? Um, you know, perhaps I could could start with you for for that question. Yeah, sure. I think that the uh, Shota was so well describing the situation, what we went through, you know, and the. Um, this situation and the ongoing the protest, you know, again shows the West uh, that the Georgian people are very motivated and determined to fight for their freedom and the Euro-Atlantic future, because we don't have any other future except to be a part of the European and the Western, like, you know, the world, because it's our destiny, it's our historical choice, not only the, like, a, uh, of our generation, you know, it's, this is where the our like you know the 
uh, parents, grandparents, and their parents are fighting for many, many centuries. And in in correlation with the Russia, we're like fighting for this like last last two centuries almost. You know now, and um, you know that the proof that uh, always you will like you know they heard this like you know the Georgian pessimists. Uh, question where are the Georgian people? We are here, you know, and we, we are fighting for this every single year and moment of our life. And uh, you know that uh, unfortunately, I would like to uh, it, like, you know, the, attract your attention on this regard that uh, the West was not so like, you know, the interested on in this regard because before the Ukraine, before the war started in Ukraine, Everything was so like a nice, and the, our Western partners as well. Somehow they're flirting with the current Georgian government because they do not have had any ambition. They do not have any motivation to ask something more than we had uh, before that. You know, and uh, uh, we think that the uh, the uh, miss, uh, missing of the West as well was some kind of like a trigger to Georgian government to get there because they were not punished before you know to well, whatever they did to georgia for backsliding from their democratic path and uh, even now you know that we're looking forward and we're asking our western partners because all these people who voted for this uh, law about the foreign agents this 78 people you know most of them uh, they are like a uh, kids were traveling to United States, their wives and uh, the, like, you know, the family members are enjoying the life there. And uh, it should it should be some kind of like a punishment from the West, because what they did to Georgian people and for the rest of the world, because otherwise, if they're going to avoid this, uh, like, you know, the uh, punishment right now, they will go further because they uh, if the West should stop the Georgia in 2008 in, Georgia, in Tbilisi and in Georgia, when it happened, the invasion of Georgia, then the, we will never get the Ukraine and the Crimea and some other like brutal issues which happened after that. And we strongly like advise or ask to our Western partners to act now because, I mean, it's uh, it goes to the West interest to crack down and the finish the job to crack down the Russian devil empire and the current government of the uh, of Georgia, they do not represent the Georgian people, you know, Georgian people thinks and as you mentioned 80 people percent of population is uh, for Euro Atlantic. Uh, uh, like you know the joining Euro Atlantic uh, family and the 85% of the Georgian population feels and thinks that the war going in Ukraine is their war. And the, there are almost like 4,000 Georgians are fighting shoulder to shoulder the Ukrainians to defend your and our freedom. And there are 40 people who died and sacrificed the Georgians, uh, their lives for the, uh, to this freedom. And we strongly believe that it's victory gonna come very soon and we fight for to the, uh, to, till the victory. And uh, no one can stop the Georgian people. We know that it's our fight, it's our domestic fight, but please do your job from your end. This is also highly, <laughs> will be very much appreciated from your side. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. And a, a very, a very strong message uh, and, and couldn't agree more that the, the West really needs to, to step up and support uh, the Georgians who are on the front line fighting, fighting for their Euro-Atlantic ambitions and fighting for a, a democratic Georgia. Um, wanted to offer the opportunity for, for other folks to, to jump in on this question if, if you'd like. So um, I think that, uh, you know, the message from the Georgian dream is clear um, uh, that they don't want for Georgians uh, uh, the membership of um, the NATO or EU. And uh, for us, it's so clear, I mean, uh, for for many for many reasons so if we look at the the, the last months how they uh, were attacking the uh, the western ambassadors right so what kind of message box they had uh, and i will repeat again that the west wants to drag georgia in war 
So then uh, another um, uh, example of this is uh, uh, that uh, how they um, like, you know, how they deal with these 12 recommendations, right? So we looked at these recommendations. Uh, the Georgian dream needed only two months to implement all of them. And they even did not need this, you know, they knew what would be in these 12 recommendations right from the beginning. As Shota mentioned, it was, these were the same issues that were mentioned in so-called Charles Michel's agreement, the party agreements of 19th of April. So, and this is why we had the concerns. We said, we were saying that, okay, so don't wait for the final decision uh, of the European Union. You can implement majority of these uh, uh, reforms really in several, some of them are like really so simple that they could do this in several weeks even. The small changes in the legislation and the drafts of those legislations were already discussed in the public and some of them were also discussed for first or second hearings in the parliament. But what they did, they arrested the critical media um, outlet uh, director. So, um, and so this is why we, and now with this law, the same, right? So, and this is why we say that you know, they now use this time to, again, to persuade the Georgian public uh, that the West, in fact, is not the friend of Georgia. And they are manipulating with different messages. Um, in Behind the closed doors, they say that, yes, they know they want EU and NATO, but what, what they do, they don't do anything to reach this. And with this law, with the foreign agent law, they directly said, uh, they sent the message to our Western partners that we don't need your assistance. You know, we don't need anything from you. The financial assistance, the political support, we just don't need this, you know? And even uh, when first, day, during the first days when this law was introduced, so they had the message from our Western friends, from the ambassadors that, they will review some of the assistance that they, for them, it will be very difficult to implement some projects, not even the projects related to the uh, democracy, but majority of the projects are uh, um, about the development of economy of Georgia and all these kind of things. And still, you know, it was not the strong message, uh, strong message enough for the government you know, and they were ready not to get millions of euros and dollars to make sure that our people will be in the poverty, to make sure that our people will not get the assistance from the civil society because the, the majority of projects are about the free legal assistance or the, the, like you know, education, uh, children's rights and all these kind of things. And only when people protested, you know, and this is where they are, uh, they, why they are afraid. But again, for the people, it's these statements, all the articles, all the statements were very important. You know, they were backed. They thought that they are fighting for the right cause and they are not alone in this fight. That's why it's important to continue, to continue pressuring the government and now to think about stricter measures we all know who are those people who are initiating this undemocratic um, loss. We know who decides, and this is Mr. Ivanishvili. So we know who are those people around him who enrich themselves through corruption. And some of them are owning the entire West propaganda medias. We know all these people. So we, it's important to target these individuals, not the Georgian people, but those individuals who are backing this um, democratic backsliding in Georgia. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And Anaka, you touched on, on the next question that I had, uh, which is, uh, you know, in addition to the EU and the, um, the commitments it set, it set previously, um, what does the net West need to be doing right now to, to hold Georgia accountable for these most recent actions? What can the West do uh, to, to support 
um, those that are fighting to uh, maintain Georgia's democracy? Um, what can the West do to support the Georgian people? Um, so Julie or Shouts, I'd love to, to bring you in to answer this question. Uh, Julie, perhaps I'll turn over to you first. Well, I think it's important that the West take a multi-pronged approach because um, uh, while the, the kind of current narrative is about um, Russian encroachment um, and uh, Russian ties, and so it, it pits the domestic conditions inside of Georgia as a kind of a, a, a Russian Western dynamic, geopolitical dynamic, I think there are, there's a lot of stuff to do in Georgia itself. Um, and I think the, the most important component of Georgian democratic development, which has always been stagnant, has been the development of an independent judiciary that is actually capable of implementing laws um, and a political system that is willing to have that enforcement and endure that enforcement. And to have that, you need to have real uh, meaningful uh, public defender's office, right, that can observe uh, crimes um, that the government in, in, um, involves itself in, and then also um, an enforcement mechanism that um, holds the rule of law um, and holds those individuals accountable. Uh, and that's never really been developed in Georgia. And so what that means is that the ability to democratize in Georgia is based on the willingness of elites uh, to, to kind of subvert their own incentives. Uh, the, the most recent change of power in Georgia, which occurred in 2012, happened because the United National Movement lost an election and was willing to lose an election and step down. Uh, and it was that willingness um, that that allowed that change of power to happen, an electoral change of power, which is very, very meaningful precedent for Georgia, but it's not been repeated. And the reason why it hasn't been repeated uh, is because election laws are not maintained, uh, competitive elections are not supported, independent media is not protected. In fact, lately it's been punished, right, which this current um, agent law is, is meant to even fully develop. Um, there's not been enough economic development in Georgia so that there are alternative sources for resources and money to empower these places and these organizations and these alternative frameworks of power. And so what that does is it gives the current regime an ability to maintain all those resources while keeping the rest of the system impoverished. Um, and that impoverishment, I think, to my mind, uh, linked to the absence of, of a real and meaningful independent judiciary and real and meaningful rule of law, uh, keeps Georgia in this cycle where real democratic governance only happens because the political leaders who happen to be in power agree that it should be so. And we also know that with democratic governance, of course, people are permitted to leave power, right? They're voted out of office. There are, you, you have an opposition that you have a transition of power, transformation of power. But because the current leadership loses, only has to lose if that actually happens in Georgia, their incentives for letting that happen are very, very, very low. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, Shota, I'll turn to you next for the same question on, on what should the West be doing now to, to, support, uh, to support Georgians? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this. So I will not repeat what I already said about the need of changing the policy based on the new realities, uh, not so new for us, but now evidently visible for everybody based on the understanding that we are dealing with the regime, anti-democratic regime that has hijacked the country, monopolizes all resources in the country, all axis of power, all sources of power and money in the country, leaving the society vulnerable to the pressure from the government. So that's uh, first, I mean, understanding and reflecting this in the policymaking process that we're no more, we're not dealing with a partner country anymore from that perspective that the regime which is there is going the other way and we need to call a spade a spade. And it's, this is not only a problem of the narratives or the messaging, this is a policy problem. Because if, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give one example. Next, uh, last time the United States uh, was celebrating July the 4th, uh, the big, uh, biggest holiday, uh, one of the biggest holidays in the United States. The, you know what happened in the embassy? The chairman of the 
legal uh, and judiciary committee of the parliament of, of Georgia has physically beaten up the director and CEO of a uh, critical media outlet on American soil in Tbilisi in Georgia. Do you know how much political or economic price he had to pay for that? Zero. So until these people are allowed to do all these things without any skin having in the game, because knowing that anyway, you know, America is a partner, they will not push as hard as the Russians. You know, they're afraid of Russians because they know Russians can kick, but they have, they, they don't care about how ugly it looks in Washington because they know that it's very difficult to, to uh, for the American policy to get to any sort of consequences. So what I think now is absolutely fundamental to do is that we need to move away from this diplomatic statements, which by the way are used against the pro-democracy stakeholders in Georgia. Another example, the worst ever elections that has ever been conducted in Georgia, it was this last parliamentary elections. There has been thousands of violations recorded by the watchdogs and civil society organizations. None of them were actually even discussed in the courts. They were just dismissed as ir ir irrelevant. So again, I mean, having this all tools in their hands, they have conducted these elections the way they wanted. And we have heard from the observers of the missions that because they have not seen physically how people were staffing the ballots in front of the observers or in front of the incoming delegations, well, this was, yes, there were some shortcomings. It was not free and fair, but it was still legitimate. And then, you know, when me, Eka, Nino, and others are going and talking to our public saying that this were stolen elections. There has been vote buying, there has been intimidation and uh, use of administrative resource. And that's why, that's how they won this election. They're saying, well, I mean, I don't know. There was observers, there was the statements from our partners. We haven't seen anything like that here. And the government uses this diplomatic statements as an ammunition against the democratic stakeholders and they use it against us, you know, to in, in their information warfare to uh, make the case to the public that we are liars, we are just politically motivated, we just don't like this government. That's why we're saying this kind of things. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, elections were okay. So please uh, understand that. This is not just about messaging. This is about which side our partners are. At. Are they at the side of the regime, which is doing all things, or are they are at the side of the pro-democracy stakeholders that are trying to save last remnants of Georgia's democracy uh, in this country? So one example what can be immediately done here to make it, to, to send a clear message and the signal that the United States supports democracy in Georgia, not only through the diplomatic statement and full stop, which is of course appreciated, but also through the policy. It is possible to announce a package of preemptive sanctions and to just say, to, to put the sanctions up there and say that everybody who will vote for this undemocratic, anti-constitutional, anti-Georgian law on the second or the third hearings in the parliament, should they occur, will, this package of preemptive sanctions will automatically apply to those people. So now this is a proactive policy. This is showing that actually there will be some consequences and there is something that will physically happen in case these people take another hit on Georgia's democracy and initiate another step back uh, uh, against Georgian stakeholders. And, and this can still work as a preemptive measure. This is the only thing that can actually keep these people 
from doing this because then there will, there will be the personal choice for them. They do not care about the future of Georgia, but they care about themselves and their families. They want to send their children to schools in Europe and the uh, United States. They want to spend their vacations in, uh, uh, in uh, the Western countries. They don't want to send their children to school in Krasnodar and they don't want to spend their vacation in uh, occupied Crimea. They want Georgian people to be deprived uh, uh, for, of the opportunity to be closer with the West, but for themselves, they want it. So let it be their personal choice. If they don't want the West, let it start with them. And then we will see, you know, uh, th that will give them the possibility to think twice before they make this moves against Georgia and Georgia's democracy and people of Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shota. Uh, we are now reaching the end of our time for this discussion. Before we close, I wanted to give uh, our panelists uh, one, one final sentence that they would convey to, to policymakers here in DC and Europe. Um, so, so please keep just to, to one, one sentence that you think uh, folks here need to know. Uh, Eka, I'll turn to you, uh, or sorry, Nina, I'll turn to you first. Okay, uh, we're gonna fight for to the end and we're not going to give up and please it's our like you know to ask to our western partners um to help us morally to feel us that you are backing us and if you cannot um, help us at least do not undermine us thank you so much and hope till the victory thank you echo over to you so uh yes we know that this is our fight this is our country and uh, we know that this fight is very hard but uh it worth it so like you know we will do everything that we can to make sure that georgia becomes the member of eu and nato and the same mood has like everyone in georgia everyone like all the patriots of georgia Thank you. Uh, Julie, over to you. I think that the West should focus on a couple of things. I mean, one, um, rhetorically, rhetorically and, and in narrative, of course, support uh, Georgian democracy and continue to support Georgian democracy and its engagement with the West. I think it's important strategically to locate any, um, any divergences inside uh, the Georgian Dream Party. I think there are probably many, many people who are very skeptical of this of this law and what it means for Georgia. And I think that is an arena to uh, explore. Uh, and I think also the continued support for investigative journalism, for civil society organizations and free media is absolutely necessary. Perfect. Uh, and Shota, over to you. Over to you. Uh, I think I've been talking too much today. So I'll just say that glory to the freedom loving people of Georgia. They will win, I'm sure, and Slava Ukraine. A fantastic note to end on. I wanted to extend again a huge thank you to all of our panelists for, for joining today. Uh, Nino, Eka, Julie, and Shota, thank you so much for, for joining for this discussion and helping to shine a light on this important issue and, and the issues that are going on in Georgia. Uh, again, this has been uh, an event hosted by the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, we are going to continue uh, to investigate this issue and shine a light on the, the democratic backsliding going on in Georgia. Um, so please follow our uh, our Twitter at CEPA, at CEPA, go to our website, CEPA.org, for more research and analysis, and we hope to see you again at future events. Thank you very much.